north for centuries. Throughout the winter, the dogs clock up an impressive mileage. We estimate every dog runs somewhere between six and six and a half thousand kilometers in the winter. That's incredible. Now these dogs have a hard life, don't they? I mean, a hard life, but a very happy life. Yeah. This is what they're meant to be doing. Um, it would be even harder on the dogs not taking them out running as we do. These dogs aren't like normal domestic dogs in Britain. They thrive in extreme temperatures. When they're out working, they need minus 20 degrees Celsius or colder to be able to give it all without running hot. So today, when it's minus 10, it's quite warm for them, actually. Mind you, though, they don't lose body heat from lying still in the snow unless it's below 50. Then they have to you know, move around a little bit to maintain body heat. So this is no problem at all. The dogs know to follow trails already made by snowmobiles. As the harder the snow has been compacted, the faster they can run. For each sled, there is one dog which takes control of the rest of the pack and is known as the lead dog. Staffan doesn't use reins to steer the pack, but relies on his lead dog, the white one here on the right, to follow his commands. Target, 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 target. Well, that was fantastic. We've come a long way today. It's over 50 kilometers and the dogs are tired now. You can see that they start to slow down on the hills and you have to help them a lot more, but that's all part of it. But it's great. There was a tricky moment coming through the woods when uh, the sledge it turned suddenly and the sledge went the wrong way of the wrong, wrong side of a tree and I just added, whoa, hang on. And although the dogs don't understand any English, they knew what to do. And they just stopped and waited, sorted it, and said, OK, and away we went. It's fantastic. It's brilliant. A snowmobile can't do that. It can't think for you. It's a marvellous way to travel. What a great way to start my time up here in the north. For the next few days, I'll be staying in traditional log cabins like this, and exploring the bushcraft of Swedish Lapland. The Arctic can be a tough place to survive in winter. Temperatures can drop by 30 degrees within hours. Traveling here, you are often miles from help, which means at any time, you may have to rely upon your skills. But with a little knowledge and the right equipment, there is food to be found. Under my feet is a fast-flowing river full of fish. After digging through the snow, I drill a hole through the ice, which is about a metre thick, into which I'll set my line. In all, I'm going to drill five holes to give me the best chance of catching something. One of the joys of this environment is that this water is clean enough. You can drink it straight from the rivers like that. Fantastic. That is beautifully fresh water. And you get very thirsty here because the air is so dry at these temperatures that every breath you take, your body has to humidify it. So you lose a lot of water just breathing here. These are the hooks. I've got them here ready to go.
very simple knot. Doesn't need to be anything elaborate. Now, the fish I'm trying to catch is called a burbot. And the way I'm going to catch it is by using a bait fish like this. And I've got to squeeze it and make sure that the swim bladder, which is like a little, little chamber of air inside him, is burst so that he doesn't keep floating up underneath the ice. I flush the hole with the auger so that the bait is sucked down into the river. This river is quite fast flowing and underneath the ice here there are little sandbars which move so you never know quite what the depth is going to be when you put the line down. And what I want is that I've got to have this line just off the bottom. Now, I can feel there when the line stops going down like that, that's that's the bottom there, just there. Tying the line to the stick means I can hang it in the center of the hole where it is less likely to freeze. Stuffing some spruce boughs down the hole also helps to prevent it freezing over. But the most important thing is to cover it with a thick layer of insulating snow. So I can find it again. I mark it with these sticks. And there are just four more to do. If I'm lucky, I might get them done before nightfall. It's best to leave the lines for at least one night. They say around here that a full moon helps to get the fish biting. I've learned to trust this sort of advice. I'll find out when I go back and check them sometime tomorrow. In the winter, the forest is blanketed with snow and looks and sounds completely different. It's impossible to get around without skis. The skis that Bjorn made are working perfectly. Of course, skis like this are not designed for downhill peace skiing. They're designed to access the deep snow in the forest. And for that, they excel. One of the things I really love to do is to get out into the forest, particularly on a day like this, and just have a look around, see what's moving, read the newspaper of the woods, the tracks written on the ground. It's magical. Despite it being winter, there are still many animals around, though some are easier to spot than others. With the crew in tow, I'm not likely to see much today. But what I am interested in is the stories their tracks can tell. All through the forest here are these trails and they look quite large but actually they're left by a very small creature. These are left by the ptarmigan. The ptarmigan is one of the birds that does stay here throughout the winter. They're very well adapted to living in the snow, even having feathers between their claws to act like snowshoes. What they're looking for, in fact, you can, I can see very clearly that they've already eaten them, are the buds that occur on the birch here. These little marks here are made by the wingtips as it's landed. You can see here where his feet have come in hard and there's the impression of the bird's body. That's the actual landing site. And then that bird's walked along here, <laughs> come up here, gone to the toilet and then turned and taken off. This is the trail of a fox from the crispness of the tracks that have been left here.